Hello, my name is Ran and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode we interview inspiring movers, thinkers and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you're having an absolutely wonderful day. Now, I haven't talked about this too much on the podcast, but my wife Jo and I, we are currently building a yoga studio behind our house. It's been going on for a few months now and we're just a few weeks out from completion and we're really starting to get excited about it. We want this to be a really inclusive, body positive space and really put into practice a lot of the things that we've been learning from all the amazing guests we've had on this podcast. So it's been an amazing experience so far and I just cannot wait for this to move forward a little bit. So that's enough about that for now. Just wanted to let you know that there's exciting things happening in the future there. So for this episode, Joe and I sit down and chat with the wonderful K Tribe. Now, as well as having an absolutely amazing name, K Tribe is a Melbourne-based yoga teacher and a teacher of teachers. She is a Yoga Australia registered yoga therapist and a member of the International Association of Yoga Therapists. Kay is the co-director of the Academy of Yoga and Mind Body Education and has taught a wide range of students over many years. With her background as a qualified myotherapist and lecturer in a range of health science subjects including functional anatomy, she has a deep knowledge of functional anatomy and how it can be useful to yoga teachers and yoga therapists. Now, Kay was one of Joe's teachers when she did her yoga teacher training many years ago, so we already wanted to have her as a guest on the show, but a couple of our guests, Lee Blaschke and Janet Lowndes, they more or less insisted that we get her on the show. Perhaps insisted is too strong a word, but they, they definitely suggested that we get Kay on. Lee describes Kay as a superstar, and after meeting her and speaking to her and learning from her, I can understand why she has a really deep and clear knowledge of anatomy and explains it in a very clear and lucid manner so it would be amazing to study with her we asked in a few groups on facebook if people had anatomy questions and we put those questions to Kay, and she answered them really well there's some really good stuff there particularly around hypermobility and how to work with people who are hypermobile perhaps you are yourself so there's some good information there anyway that is definitely enough from me let's get on to the conversation with Kay perhaps we could start by you telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up absolutely yes I'm a Melbourne girl Williamstown that lovely older part of Melbourne that's where I was first born and southeastern suburbs after that so I was raised in Mount Waverley back when it was you know the creek at the end of the road and it was still a little bit orchards which it isn't anymore but almost the outskirts of Melbourne back then oh wow now it's completely in Melbourne <laughs> totally different now yes yeah so that's where I've lived most of my life on that southeastern side then I actually did what a lot of young people should do I got in a combi and traveled around Australia for two years oh great mm. and then from there I've lived in all different parts around Melbourne so were you fruit picking or something as you were traveling? Uh, anything. Or anything. Um, I think we were making mud bricks at some stage. We were grape picking, lots of bar work, you know, anything you could pick up on the way. Fantastic. It was a wonderful experience, yes. It must have been a great way to see Australia. It was. The Northern Territory is an incredible state, so we spent mm. a lot of time up there. So when did you discover yoga? Around that time, interestingly. I can remember trying some of those wonderful classes with the Satyananda group where again by donation so we thought we'll just try it out we're off on an adventure we have something new try it out and i can remember thinking wow this is for me this is definitely for me and then i swung back to yoga when i was pregnant so i was 29 when i was pregnant and a very dear friend at the art center i was working at the art center at the time he said kay here's a gift you need some relaxation that was the best gift and that's when i realized ah this is what yoga does to you so very, very calming, very clearing. It's like, yes, I can think better when I do a proper relaxation class. So that was my real introduction to yoga when I was pregnant. Beautiful. Mm. And when did you decide that you wanted to teach yoga? Oh, it's um, a bit of a journey from there. So it was a Gita yoga. They used to run hour-long relaxations. And then I moved up to prenatal yoga with Di Lucas. And then they were also running neonatal, which is really unusual. So you'd bring your baby along with you. So you'd get to do a practice and the baby would be on the floor in front of you. 
Then it moved into Kuti School. So Kuti School is a little bit like a mother and child approach to kinder or pre-kinder. Oh. It was exceptional. It was a fabulous experience. So Di Lucas has um, a huge wealth of information from her years as a primary school teacher. So she was aware that little ones really need lots of stimulation as early as possible. So by the time they get to school, they've really been stimulated in the right way. So stimulating all the senses, for example, because she was well aware that the, the adult nervous system starts to cull a lot of the stimulation as you become an adult. So she thinks if you start really early with appropriate stimulation, you end up with a much more interesting adult. That yeah. makes so much sense. It's a fabulous program. So then my daughter went into Steiner School from there, and again, the same type of stimulation. So throughout this process, I realised there's a whole new world out there. So I thought, I'd like to be part of this. And Gita offered a scholarship. So I was a sole parent, and they offered the scholarship. And of course, I said, yes, please, I'll do that. So as a sole parent, um, when my daughter was about five, I went through that process that you've both been through, which is an incredible process, isn't it, doing teacher training? Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. all the way with Geeta from the time I was pregnant till my daughter was about five when I finally did teacher training. And a lot of people might not know what a foundational presence Geeta yoga is in, in Melbourne. Melbourne. Yes, yeah. yes. It's been around since the 50s, so... Margaret Sigesman was one of the very first teachers here in Melbourne, set up in Albert Place in Melbourne, so on that very exclusive side. Um, I don't know if you know Albert Place, you're sort of towards Russell Street end. And Margaret used to share stories with us when we were doing teacher training, but one of the things she would say is a lot of women would say they were going off to do yoga, and a lot of people really didn't understand. Yoga? Yoga? What do you mean? <laughs> so... Apparently, at that time, a lot of women had to almost disguise their interest in yoga. So they'd be saying they're going after book class or book club oh. because it just wasn't done. Like it was just too out there. It's too out there. Yeah. So she used to attract a lot of women from a fairly affluent background. So they had to make up a story as to why they were going to do their yoga. And I guess the women who have spare time. To they were the ones somewhere. that had the spare time. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So very small following to start and then it grew pretty rapidly and Di Lucas and Lucy Wood took over when Margaret decided she needed to pull back. So Margaret was an incredible woman, but she had rheumatoid arthritis and a few problems, her health problems. So she pulled back and the other two women took over. That's who I did my training with. Gita's really interesting. I think around the same time as yoga was being developed in Sydney, there's another man, Michael Voilin, I think his surname is. So they were the two first yoga centres in Australia around in the 1950s. But Diane Lucille then took the understanding of yoga into a Western scientific approach. So linking all the wonderful energy medicine and coming across and making sense of how it fits in with our understanding from a Western perspective. Like the endocrine system. The is endocrine really system is very, very big. Yes, absolutely. So that may have been something the two women had studied themselves. But there was a very strong link when we were doing training that you would be thinking about, first of all, the central nervous system, the spinal cord. Then you'd work with balancing the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system and then progressively work from the endocrine glands in the base part of your body and work your way up and then finish up with the pineal gland. So the logic behind a Gita class is it starts with preparing the centre and then drawing you from the base up to the upper component. So really an energetic approach as well. But and they really correlate each gland to each chakra? Right. Yes, very right. strong correlation in that way that that's taught. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, which is unique. I haven't seen that approach in any other teacher training mm. in Australia or even overseas. Because it's just the seven postures each class. Right. There's 10, oh, there's yeah. Ten. No, yeah. That, that, you're quite right. So if you go to a Gita class, there's a structure, always starting with a mudra, spine twist, back bend, and then you're quite right. There's a, a posture or a group of postures that links to each of the centres. Yeah. They also have a very plush relaxation room with lots of kind of sheepskins and... Oh, wow. <laughs> it, is, it is wild. It's a beautiful experience. So that was my first experience when I was pregnant and I had that same response, like, I feel nurtured. Mm. I feel looked after. I feel contained in here. It's safe in here. And you're right, that's what the environment does for you. I don't want to play into gender stereotypes, but do you think that strong female presence... <laughs> In Gita, kind of brings in that maternal... Absolutely, absolutely. Quite different to an Iyengar style. 
Orishtanga style, I have to agree with you. Yes, it's very much about nurturing, um, feeling safe, feeling contained. Yeah. Mm. And it's sort of interesting that nowadays a lot of yoga studios, they're all very sparse and mm. sort of... Clean um, lines. White yeah. White walls. Mm. And, mm. Yeah, so it's interesting to sort of evolution, I <laughs> yeah, guess. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, my memory of Gita <laughs> is really rich, dark pink carpet and red mm. colours on the walls and... Yes, you felt like you were within a, oh, a space that was welcoming and warm, mm-hmm. which is quite different to the sparse feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My other memory of our visit of Gita, which we went to as part of our course because we went to lots of different yoga studios, mm-hmm. is they have a couple of resident poodles. And during the class, the poodle had its special cushion up on the stage. <laughs> Excellent. That really stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> Very unique. <laughs> and so how did the myotherapy mm. come into the mix? Yeah, a good question. I was one of those very fortunate people. I think at the same time that I was studying my teacher training, I was finishing up my myotherapy. So I had enrolled in that probably five years before I became a mum. And it was just perfect that I graduated with yoga teacher training and myotherapy as the two skills. So I blended the skills straight away. So you did both of those and were a single mum of a yes. five-year-old. Yes, <laughs> you know, you do. You make these decisions sometimes and you wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do it now in my 50s, but it was appropriate back in my late 20s. <laughs> and so you were just learning from both streams. I was constantly, constantly linking the two, yes. And is that because you always wanted to practice both or you were just fascinated by how the body works? Mm, I was thinking about that on the way in. I think I grew up with an enhanced sense of empathy is how I think of it. So I was always well aware of suffering. So the two streams were ways of supporting anyone who was suffering. So that's why I went into healing. So how, like, fantastic to have that realisation <laughs> and then to have a clear path yeah. of how you can put it into action. Absolutely, yes. And I'm sure it serves you well as a trainer of teachers now as yes, well. Yes, because I find that, and you're quite right, teacher trainees, and I also still work as a teacher of students becoming massage and myotherapists, so very similar in their approach to healing. So I find as a teacher in both areas, it's really helpful to say to young people there's also boundaries like healing is a wonderful thing to go in but you've got to look after yourself too so always got to be self-healing before you're going to be a healer so Mm -hmm. you're quite right but that's an area that I, I, I come back to all the time you've got to look after yourself first and so obviously there are professional boundaries which are usually spelled out yes are there any kind of more subtle self prayer practices Definitely. that you do for yeah. yourself? So to... then now you're talking more about personal boundaries. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so Yoga Australia has done a great job of creating professional boundaries. But personal boundaries are more about recognizing how much energy you've got to give in that day. And you don't need to give out 100%. It's okay to leave 20% for yourself. So I think that's that recognition of what am I going to do in the next 24 hours and how much am I using some of that for me? And it's really important to learn that. And not wasting some of that on feeling guilty about the things that you're not doing. Absolutely, yeah, guilty. The feeling guilty is not helpful at all. I remember learning anatomy from you when I did my teacher training. And but you're a really wonderful anatomy (laughs) teacher because it's a pretty baffling subject Mm. when you come across it for the first time. And you did a really great job of breaking it down into the practical things that would really help us as teachers and not getting too bogged down into learning Latin names of everything. It kind of means you don't really take in any information when you're trying to take in all of the information. So how did you decide what you were going to put in? Because when I did the course, it was over a thousand hours and two years. So you probably did have a bit more time to allocate to anatomy than the average 200 or 350 hour teacher training course. But I'm sure you still had to make some careful decisions about what you were going to focus on Mm. and what you were going to leave out. Mm, Definitely. I'm a kinesthetic learner. So I learn by doing, feeling, touching. That's probably why I went towards the myotherapy side. And I even notice now you've got to be careful not to teach just to the head. You've got to really teach in a way that your students embody and feel what it is that they're learning. So I think that's how I made my decisions, Joe. I thought about, all right, how do I embody or how am I going to encourage students to embody what they're learning? So you're right. I thought, oh, yeah, Latin, that's fine. They can come back to that. They can read that. Yeah, that's in a book. That's in a book. That's right. Let's feel it. Let's see what the body does when we talk about a movement. Let's actually do the movement and make sense of it that way. So that's probably how I made the decisions, I think that's why it worked so well for me as well because you actually – 
when you feel it in your body, then yep. you can understand it Absolutely. and draw from it. Yeah, yes. And even thinking about your comments about how much anatomy, you know, do you fit into a longer course compared to a shorter course, that's a constant juggle to really, you know, you've got to think, what are the foundations that someone who's about to go out and teach the public, what do they really need to know? And you've got to come back to, is it a concept of teaching what you must know, what you should know, what you could know? You just stay with the must. You must know this. Mm-hmm. And the rest you pick up later. And there's always, as you were doing it, you would always give reference material for if you want to go deeper into That's this. It. Here's yeah. the notes. Go do some more reading. Yeah. And so, and not everyone who teaches yoga is going to relate to anatomy in the same way that I do. I mean, it feels right for me. And maybe it felt right for you, but not every teacher comes to it with that same attitude. So you give them enough so they can go out and be a safe teacher. The other thing that I think you really emphasised, and I guess this is a functional anatomy thing, is just the differences between people. So it's not about learning the right way to do something or how something should look. It's like, well, what are you feeling in your body? Absolutely. What sensation are we looking for? Yeah. And I think that's what yoga therapy has started. So yoga therapy in Australia is starting to expand. And I think there's an understanding of how that's different to a one-to-one yoga class. It's about recognizing the individual person. And you're absolutely right. How is your structure different to your structure? And how will that impact upon a movement or a breathing practice or even a meditation practice? So you really have to bring it across all of those wonderful modalities that are coming under the banner of yoga. So it's not just physical movement. It's the breathing practices. It's the meditation and the focus. It's the sense withdrawal. So each individual have their very different approach to that. And that's exciting. That's what yoga therapy mm. does for us now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're mm. all these multi-layered beings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think as well with that approach, if you have a very didactic, this is the right way to do this thing, it's almost like sometimes you're disempowering someone from their own experience and people might just put up with something that like feels bad in their back because they mm. think that's how it's meant to feel if that's how the pose is going to look that way. Mm. So I think from the really big, the beginning, you were really big on rather than laying down rules, asking questions. Absolutely. Yeah, learn your practice or do your practice with your own experience, your own exploration. And I would suggest now we're even more going in that direction. So I think of the teaching team I've got around me. Every teacher I have around me works that way. So I think it's a much more encompassing nurturing going back to the Gita beginnings way to teach and Mm. empowering and it actually takes the pressure off you as a teacher because you're not responsible for someone's experience it's their experience yeah so it's interesting with your language isn't it as a teacher you you don't want to lead too much but you need to lead enough Mm. so that the student is safe in the practice but you don't want to be telling the student what they should be feeling you invite them to explore what comes up for them Yeah, it's quite different in the languaging that you use. Mm, And it kind of seems to really relate to the trauma-sensitive approach as well. Absolutely. We were talking to Joe Bjork about this in our last interview. Yep. As we've been saying, like anatomy really is an endless subject and there is always more to learn. And I can think of about four different kind of anatomy-focused trainings that are on my list of things to do in the near future. Most yoga teachers have limited time and a limited budget. What do you think is a realistic amount of professional development to kind of aim for in a year? And I'm thinking that most teachers are probably pretty tough on themselves and Mm. feeling like they're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. I know as well that there are some like great free resources out there as well. So... What do you think is a good ballpark to aim for if you want to kind of stay up to date and kind of continue to develop yourself as a teacher? Hmm. So you're thinking this in relation to learning a bit more functional anatomy, but across the board. I can't do four courses next year. Yeah, so how do I choose? Is one reasonable? Yes. Is one every two years reasonable? I've got you. I understand where you're coming from. Structure doesn't change a lot. So the use of functional is really interesting. So anatomy as a concept basically does mean structure. Whereas functional anatomy is, okay, so it looks this way, but how does it work? Which is why we differentiate. So you can have the anatomy of the heart, you can have the function of the heart. So I tend to think, or I think that yoga teachers are better to learn about the function of something. Mm. Then they don't get caught up in those rules you're referring to. I would suggest if you're really enthusiastic about this, definitely do some online reading, absorb as much as you can. Maybe Leslie Kamenoff's mm-hmm. um, YouTubes are really, really helpful. The other one is Yoga You Online. 
and then you write down what you're still not sure of. My, my suggestion is learn as much as you can, but then when you come to some sort of training, you've got a list of things. I'd like to know more about that, 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 that. Oh, that's such a good idea. Like make yourself a Google document or something. Yes, yeah. And that's what Claire and I are doing now with the, the videos because those sorts of questions are coming to us. One example, I think you've mentioned it as well, is we had someone come to us recently and say, the gluteal region. I don't understand it. I've got someone who doesn't use the gluteals. And we thought, okay, we'll actually explore that. Yes. So that's our latest video that we've put together. Because so that would su- be a great resource for people to go to. Exactly. But it's such a common problem. So that's what we're trying to do is we're hearing teachers say, look, oh, we keep coming across this same problem. Can you guide me? So we're starting to give teachers, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And then if they've still got questions, then they've got those questions ready when they come to a postgraduate course. So the idea, I think, is to educate teachers as much as you can in an online forum. And that's something we're also doing with our teacher training we're doing a a balance of face-to-face and what would be called learning management system which is a Moodle system lots of unis use that so it allows the student to ponder on what they learnt in the face-to-face session and do a bit of reading do a bit of thinking send an email get an answer get a discussion going by the time they come back to face to face they start to absorb it so I actually think that's the best way to learn. Especially in a postgraduate setting. Where Especially like, postgraduate, yes. You know, is that like one weekend a month in exactly. person? Exactly, one week a month. And then give yourself some time in the next few weeks to absorb it. Practice it in your teaching. That brings more questions up. Mm. And then by the time you come back to the class, it's really useful. I think as well that is the best way for me. If I really want to wrap my head around a new concept and learn it, like say I've done training with someone and I really want to integrate that information, just teach it for the next week. That's it. Just teach it. Try it out. See how people respond to it. Yeah. That's the best way to learn. And that's when you do notice all of those differences as well. Like that's when you really see the nuances of yes. how all of those things work. Yes, good. So everyone's got a different teaching style. And as you've mentioned, some people don't articulate a lot of anatomical information mm. in their teaching. It might be there in their sequencing or that might just not be their thing. So I guess this is a question more for the people who are super excited about their new anatomy knowledge. Yep. <laughs> and maybe confusing their students Yes. A little bit with a yes. lot of concepts, mm-hmm. yeah. kind of pulling people out of the present moment. Yeah. What do you think is a good amount of views per pose mm. that relate to anatomy or mm. concepts in a class? Mm. They're great questions. I think the first thing to ponder on is, is this a beginner student or is this a student who's been practicing for a long time? I would suggest the beginner student, minimum amount of anatomy, mm-hmm. very little. Maybe teach them one term, that's enough. Maybe teach them bending forward, this has another word, it's called flexion. That's enough for the class. You might use a lot of languaging with your beginner, and I think that's the difference between a beginner and a more advanced class. The beginner, brand new positions, brand new experiences, brand new movements, they need lots of guidance. As compared to the more experienced student, their body already knows what to do. So then you can start to refine and that's when you might bring in a little bit more anatomy. But again, I wouldn't go overboard. It's it, You don't want to take the student into their head. Yeah. You want them in their body. So in an actual teaching class, I would use generic terms most of the time. But I know what I'm thinking is mm. anatomical, mm. but I translate all the time. Generic language we use in everyday life. And I think as well, being able to break it down into simple terms actually is a sign you've probably understood it. Perfect. You're absolutely correct. That means you really know it. The simpler you can make it, that means you really know it. So... We've got some questions from Facebook. Oh, we put out a call. We said we've got an anatomy-themed podcast episode coming up. Mm-hmm. So I'll ask you some of the questions. Good. So this first one is from Fee. She says, this sounds great. I'd love to hear your take on the role of the buttocks in Cobra. I think my yin yoga training years ago has kind of messed with me on this issue, and I often find myself being very confused when I get to my Cobra. The confused cobra. It's a new asana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel for her. I really do. There is so many conflicting pieces mm. of advice around what do we do with the buttocks. Okay. I talked about this in the video, interestingly. This must be a theme We'll put a link around. in for your I video. Yeah, yeah. But it's a theme floating around the community at the moment. When we talk about the buttocks, we've got three layers of these gluteal muscles. So we've got the big surface muscle, the big maximus, first of all. I think that's the one that's being referred to with this question from the fee. A lot of teaching asks you not to engage the buttocks. 
and then other teaching will suggest that you do. So I'm going to answer that from the perspective of creating a safe experience for the student, because that's always where I come to. You need a little bit of engagement of the buttocks to balance out with engagement at the front of the pelvis to stabilize your position on the floor. So when you've got a nice stable position, you might like to feel it when you're lying there. Imagine that that pubic area is just nestling into the floor. That's enough engagement. You don't need much more than that. And from that very stable position, you can then lift up the body or if you're doing a a locust pose, it's the same concept, lift up the leg. So I would suggest you need to use the buttocks to stabilize the trunk of the body. So that the other movements can happen. Say you're doing something like a Satyabandhasana or an Udvadanyarasana where you're lifting up a little bit more of your body weight against gravity, would you engage a little bit more actively for Absolutely. those postures? Absolutely, yes. If you're doing the pose in a way that's right for your body, not as in the correct way to do the pose, right for your body, you'll actually feel that engagement. So it's a matter of exploring the feeling of it. And it's about feeling secure, steady, stira and sukha. Let's go back to those lovely yeah. basics. Yeah. You're breathing well. You feel secure. Oh, I can hold this for at least 10 breaths. It's that, that experience of the pose. Then you know you've got the right amount of engagement. So where do you think the cue to not engage your buttocks came from? <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. Yeah. It may have come from situations where students are engaging too much. You can have certain postures. One of the postures we explored when we were discussing this was when you stand upright, if you move your buttocks so that you flatten your lower back, if you can imagine that, that's actually called a posterior tilt. So it's like you're flattening the lower back. That engages the buttocks too much. And it may well have come from classes where teachers observe students doing that too much. And that will happen if you have a job in your daily life where you sit. And a lot of our students sit. They're sitting at a computer. They're very rarely outside walking around, walking up and down hills. Because if you have a a life where you're more active and you're walking on a surface that's not level all the time, you're going to use your gluteal region appropriately. But if you're, most of our students aren't. So I think that's where that's come from. So those muscles have just been locked in position all day. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. They're actually not doing very much if you're sitting in a supported chair. So when you go to do a practice, perhaps you engage too much, and that's when the teacher's trying to find the balance. Mm. That's just a theory I'm working with. It must have come from somewhere. It's come from somewhere. <laughs> Sounds plausible. Yeah. yeah. Alex asks, I'd love to know your views on the placement of the back foot in Trikonasana. Angle slightly in or straight out? Alex, that's a great question. There's a wonderful concept that um, one of the studios in Sydney is working with, and the answer to that starts with, it depends. (laughs) And I love that. But really what we're thinking about here is what's happening to the pelvis. So when we're working with a trikonasana pose, the female body will do it quite differently to the male. So the male body is designed, he could probably not have the foot angled at all. He would be having the, the back foot lined up, perhaps the heel lining up with the instep. Fine for the male body. It works. Female body, different experience of the pose. She has a totally different pelvis. She's more likely to have a little bit more flexibility in that joint between the sacrum and the ilium, called the sacroiliac joint. She needs to angle the foot. So a different answer for a different student. Again, it might be useful if you're teaching this is to try both. Mm. What feels steadier? Where has the student got more control? So I would tend to suggest I would be very careful with that very specific directive where there's a straight line. I'd let the foot angle where it needs to go. Do you cue a foot angle at all or do you just say step back and what do you cue? That's a good question. If I'm teaching, I actually use a lot of time allowing the student to prepare explore what feels right for you. I'm one of those people that's blessed, I use the word blessed here in an interesting way, where my sacroiliac joint on one side is fused but very flexible on the opposite side. So I know personally if I do the wrong thing I'm in pain for the next few days. So I've learned from experience. I'm very slow, very careful and for me personally I'd have plenty of space between my feet. So I'd have a much more open position than someone who doesn't that doesn't have a fusion would do. So I think my way of teaching would be to set something up and then encourage movement of the back foot. Now what feels right? Beautiful. You work with that. 
and it might take five minutes to set up for the pose, for example. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective of having that sacroiliac situation, do you do different things on each leg? Or, I do, yeah. totally, yes. My body can't do the same thing both sides. Because I think that's another thing that sometimes, as teachers, we say as a rule, if you've done it this way on your first side, you should do it the same way mm. on your second side. And yeah. sometimes our bodies aren't the same between that, the sides. That's making an assumption that everyone's got that perfect balance. Very unusual to have. Have you ever had anyone in your class who's symmetrical? No. <laughs> no me neither. I don't think I have. Very, very unusual. This is a question from Alice. I'm going to be teaching yin in a month or so. So I've been confronted with my fear of yin and I've been reading up on it subsequently. The yin perspective on hypermobility is that everyone's range is natural. There's no right or wrong range of motion and that yin strengthens the connective tissue in the joint. But I also keep coming across this conflicting, or conflicting for me, element in increasing mobility of the joint. So with hypermobile people, it seems that the connective tissue is softer, so it allows for a larger range of movement than usual. I'm really confused about what the benefit of yin is for hypermobile people. If it does actually strengthen the connective tissue here, then that's great. But there's a continual reference to increasing mobility, so that conflicts with any gains that hypermobile people might possibly make to increase stability, doesn't it? So confused. Good questions. Very good questions in there. Yeah, I probably would have to look at how yin is taught to answer that particular question accurately, mm. but I'll talk about it from my understanding of hypermobility. There's five very simple hypermobile tests that you can do if and it's very easy to look up. You can look it up on the internet. Hypermobility mm. test, very simple. You've got a great video on these. Yeah, yeah I've seen that one. <laughs> Funny about that. Yeah, it just, it's just useful to know because you might have a student that's hypermobile at one joint. So they're going to have a different experience of the yin practice as compared to being hypermobile everywhere. So I'll speak about it from the student who has hypermobility everywhere rather than just at the knees or the elbows. Yes, lengthening the tissue even more is going to destabilize the joint. So that's a clear answer there. Mm -hmm. If yin is taught in a way that you're finding a position but you have to push up against gravity, yes, you will strengthen the joint. But if you're going into a position and holding it for any longer than two minutes, two minutes is the magical time, the connective tissue is going to lengthen even more. So it'll destabilize. So the answer to that probably depends on how is the yin practice taught. Mm. But you really do have to push up against gravity to strengthen the area. So maybe the, the confusion might also be is which bit are we lengthening? So this might be another thing for people to imagine. When you think about a muscle, you've got fibers that slide on each other, but they have a wrapping around them. And it's the wrappings that are affected with yin practice. So if you're making the wrapping a little bit loose and sloppy, you're then, uh, mm. you're then creating problems for the overlap of the actual tissue. So it's like making um, a lovely student describe this to me. She said, it's an awful way of thinking, but imagine a cat in a bag. I said, oh, yeah, a cat in a bag. <laughs> Not that we're going to put your cat in the bag. <laughs> the cat's playing in the bag. We'll do that. If the bag's got lots of space, the cat's got lots of room. But if you tighten the bag... The cat's restricted. So you can have hypomobility as well. But you don't want to make that bag too loose and sloppy, which is what you're doing with the yin practice. Mm -hmm. I love yin, but mm -hmm. my body structure is the opposite to hypermobile. I, I love yin as well, mm -hmm. and I teach yin, mm -hmm. and I've got a couple of things that I might kind of add in. Mm -hmm. One thing that I would say if a very loose hypermobile person came to my class is not to go to their furthest edge. Perfect. So just hang out in the Perfect. mid range of where they're feeling the sensation and maybe use it more as a time to meditate, a time mm. to breathe. It doesn't always have to be an intense sensation. Also, often someone who's really hypermobile in one area will have a really corresponding tight spot. Yeah. So have a bit of a feel around in the pose so you can feel where you're tight rather than just like lengthening into where you're already really loose. And the other thing that I think about is Say you've got really hypermobile hip joints, maybe see if you can arrange yourself so that you're not feeling the sensation in the joint, but rather in a muscle area near there. It's great teaching, and that's what you're doing. You really, it is. No, you're really educating your students to differentiate what's happening at either end of the muscle. Let's go to the middle of the muscle and explore that. 
And it takes a fair bit of practice, doesn't it, for the student to be able to differentiate those feelings? And that's the beauty of yin, because Mm. you've got time to hang Mm. out and feel into those details. Absolutely, yeah. I don't know if you notice this as a teacher, but I sometimes see with hypermobile individuals, they don't have a great relationship with a part of the nervous system that gives feedback. Yeah. Yeah, have you seen that as well? I've thought about this. Mm. My theory is, like, you know, if you're tight, you mm. feel everything. Mm. Yeah. But if you're just loose and flexible, you just don't get as many messages back no. from your body. No, absolutely. And that, that's been my experience too when I've got a hypermobile person. I might use a word that I think makes sense, but the, I see the student look at me like, I don't understand. Because I'm trying to get them to feel a limitation of the movement rather than, as you said, the full potential of the movement. So I've got another lovely teacher on our faculty and she said the only way she could work with hypermobile people was to actually go and touch the joint and move it and say, try this. And then that helps to switch on the nervous system in a new position. Mm, So maybe for that hypermobile person, it's about proprioception. Absolutely. Owning their awareness of their body rather Mm. than feeling a stretch. Absolutely. So you don't, yes, you're quite right. So proprioception is to do with strength as well as stretch. So work on the strength side. Yeah, I actually have had really good results with people I've taught who are super mobile to practice strength in the end range of their movement. So don't ignore what that joint can do. Work where, you know, the full range, but work in a way where you're focusing on strengthening rather than just stretching. Brilliant. Instead of just collapsing into it, contain. I love the word containment. Contain that position. So you've actually, as you said, use the breath, use the sensations and strengthen the container for the muscle. Yeah. It's a good way yeah. to think about it. We have hypermobility. Mm-hmm. We're, we're talking about the connective tissues, you know, their degree of natural flexibility or strength or tension. But there's other reasons why someone might have more range of movement in a joint as well, right? Do you want to kind of go into yeah. the different things that might be contributing? Yeah, we'll, we'll look at this word hypermobile because in anatomy it means a couple of different things yeah, depending yeah. where you were going. When we discuss a hypermobile joint, we're talking about a joint that has a structure that allows the joint to go past what is safe. So the elbow is a great example. So if you notice that sort of banana bend in someone's elbow, it means that the way that the two bones meet, the structure between the two is usually one side's too small or one side's too big. That's the best way to describe it to you. So it goes beyond what is safe. Now, unfortunately, the person with that structural change will go to that unsafe position. And when they're doing that in a yoga practice, it means that joint is compromised and another joint then has to take up the job. So if we're talking elbows, the poor old shoulders are going to suffer. So that's where you need to be very careful as a teacher to bring that back to a contained, safe position. Now, if you're talking hypermobile and you're talking to connective tissue, so instead of a structural problem, we've now got collagen that is not quite as thick as someone else's collagen. So I'm blessed with lovely, thick, solid collagen hypermobile person the collagen fibers are actually thinner and it when when there's an injury it takes that person a lot longer to rebuild the collagen and to strengthen it so we we genetically have either very strong collagen or perhaps not as strong and once you know that you work within that so those with strong collagen go for that in practice do all that stretching stay in the pose for a long time If your collagen's finer, there's a lot of elasticity, maybe don't hold it as long, but push up against gravity. Give yourself the opportunity to develop some strength. If it isn't possible in that pose to push up against gravity, would even just consciously engaging the muscle have a That's what I mean by pushing up against gravity. And it's clarifying the language. Yeah. Yeah. So look, gravity's there as a force all the time. So if you're just adjusting your position so that you're sitting more accurately on the earth or standing or kneeling more accurately on the earth, That's working against gravity. So it's about adjusting your posture appropriately. And so say someone is feeling some sensations in their body Mm -hmm. and maybe they need yoga, so Mm -hmm. everything is kind of new. What are the sensations that are generally kind of fine to sit with and breathe into? And what are the like warning signs from your body that it's time to like ease back a little bit? Yeah, and with someone that's hypermobile, those warning signs may not be as easy to hear or feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Their muscles aren't screaming at them. Their muscles aren't <laughs> screaming, absolutely. We have this in massage as well. So the two the concept goes across a few of the industries. 
If you're in a position where you can breathe comfortably and you notice that the out breath is calm, you're okay. If you're in a position where you're breathing in but you're struggling with that out breath, you've gone into the dangerous territory. I'll just make it the breath rather than a sensation. Your breath is picking up the information really well. Is that helpful? Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. And we all have our breath. And yes. that's a great check in yes, any yoga class. Yeah. yeah. So you had a mix of people in class. Mm-hmm. What are some cues that are not going to work for a hypermobile structure as opposed to a stiffer person? And what are some cues that are just kind of work for everyone? Or is it always just you give a variety of options and you say things in a few mm. different ways? Mm, I a, guess mm. like to make that less open-ended, say you're in something like Pashimottanasana, like a deep seated mm. forward bend, mm-hmm. and someone's just melted forwards over their legs. And then, you know, there's someone else who's got the strap and is mm. like working pretty hard just to maintain an upright spine? Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, that's a good question. I'd probably even move away from the cue of what to do and maybe come back to describing what the pose is. Come back to what the pose is. Where's your foundation? What are we aiming to do in this pose? And I would probably avoid cues to be talking. I know it's me maybe pulling out of the question in the easy way, but... Well, well, no, got because that's doing an easy things. way to handle it in class yeah. rather than giving a whole lot of conflicting exactly. instructions. Come, Come back, back to like what's actually what happening. Is, that's right. Talk about the pose and then invite the student to explore the sensation in what the pose is aiming to do. So you're not aiming to get towards your feet, are you? No. That's not what it's about. So, yeah, come back to the pose each time I think is your best approach. And so say someone says, I'm not feeling anything, mm-hmm. how do you I would I would ask, so what feeling are you aiming for? What what feeling do you think is the feeling you need? Are you, are you aiming for a stretch sensation? And I'll probably ask the student to explore what they mean by, I'm not feeling anything. And then we could perhaps work with that. And that might be where you'd say to the student, this is a great conversation. We'll have a chat about this after the class. So let's explore that together. It's really difficult in a group scenario, isn't it, to deal with all those individuals. Mm, yeah. And to not kind of get drawn into a yeah. little side conversation yeah. so everyone's kind of half listening to and yeah. half trying to do their own practice. Yeah. I'd say as long as the student is safe, you're okay to leave them. If they're doing something where you think, oh, my goodness, we're going to have an injury. Mm. And I guess it. if they're not feeling enough, <laughs> in yeah. inverted commas, then they're probably pretty safe because exactly. they're not feeling too exactly. much. So. Yeah, and then come to that one later, I think, is a much safer approach. Say you are that person and you already know you're pretty flexible. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you got some helpful hints just to help that person kind of keep themselves safe in class, especially if maybe they're in a class that isn't so sensation-based and is a bit more directive and maybe a bit more forceful? So some questions or some comments to make to the student about how to protect themselves? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's probably useful for the student to hold that concept of containment. I'm working in a way that contains my energy. Maybe use the concept of energy rather than movement because as soon as you're going too far and collapsing into it, you just imagine the energy is just flowing out and away. So you probably say to the student, really useful for you to look after your own energy within that class. Protect yourself. So you can say to the teacher, if they question you, This feels absolutely fine for me, and I'm in a safe, contained position. So, yeah, maybe use the concept of energy as much as the physical movement to support your student. And that sounds like a beautiful intention just to set for anyone as they Mm. come into a yoga practice, Mm. like what's happening with my energy, I'm Mm. in charge of that. Absolutely, Yeah. yeah. There actually seems to be quite a bit of a backlash against promoting flexibility or focusing on flexibility in yoga classes and I see this in quite a few different Facebook groups where people are even questioning like why would I stretch Mm -hmm. what's the benefit Mm -hmm. what's Uh, the benefit (laughs) and this this has come through in um, the fitness industry too that's been debated for a long time so it's not just yoga the concept of flexibility I would probably um, explore that what do we mean by flexibility first of all So does it mean the ability to take my joint through its full potential range? If that's what it means, then it's a good thing. If we're talking about flexibility where we're taking joints beyond a safe range, it's not a good thing. So 
Flexibility is really to do with the quality of the connective tissue around the joint. So you don't want ligaments that are too lengthened. We destabilize the joint. So that may be where the Facebook comments are coming from. I think it's coming from people who've been injured through years of that makes sense. diligent <laughs> yoga practice. That makes sense to me too. So come back to structure. And, you know, even as you look around your own room, think about a table and look at the structure of a table. You don't want the joint between the leg and the top of the table to be wobbly. It's as simple as that. Mm. You know, that, if that's what you're you don't want in the human body you want the joint to have integrity and if everything is nicely balanced the human body has the capacity to land on the earth and push off the earth with a beautiful flow you lose that flow if the joint is too loose too sloppy you've got to use a whole lot more energy just to walk in your daily life so that's possibly where that's coming from. So think of the concept of integrity at each of your joints. This is coming from, I guess, more the yin school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know your perspective on it. The point of view that gently, in a controlled way, gently stressing our joints makes them stronger. And I guess like one example that made sense to me is um, they looked at a tennis player's racket-holding arm. Yes, and the other arm, mm -hmm. and the arm that was always feeling the impact of mm -hmm. the ball was mm -hmm. a lot stronger than the yep. other arm, which is not what we're doing in a yin class. Yep. We're not playing tennis. Yep. But the movements that we do in our lifetime obviously shape the way that our mm. body kind of lays down new collagen. And mm. I guess my question is, is there benefit to gently stressing our joints? Or absolutely. Is that just, yeah. yeah, I'm going to say yes, absolutely. So using that word stress, and you've used that really well, so we could talk about stress compared to strain. You're not straining the joint, but you're stressing the joint. And we really do need to stress the tissues of the body for them to grow and stay healthy. If we don't stress them, they shrink. It's as simple as that. So, yeah, that's a great question. So that would be how like someone was bedridden for a yeah. year. That's... Or, or maybe you've fractured um, a leg bone and you're wrapped in a cast. The leg's going to shrink, the bone's going to shrink, the muscles are going to shrink, and the connective tissue is going to tighten. So you've got to do some safe stressing to bring everything back to balance. This is another question about this issue. <laughs> <laughs> so say you are one of those people who maybe has overdone the mm -hmm. stretching mm -hmm. and you still love all of the other aspects of yoga mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. aren't stretching mm -hmm. and maybe you still teach yoga. What are some ways to make this practice as safe and sustainable for yourself and for your students and as many people as possible from here. If you're a teacher or if you're a student and there has been injuries, particularly injuries as the result of an inappropriate movement over a long time, I actually think it's a really good idea to get some other health professional to assess your movement. You can do that for yourself, but there's a difference. I, I go to my graduate students as a therapist and I say, look, Andrew is one I go to. I say, look, I need a treatment from you. You can't do it for yourself. You need to see it, someone else see it from the outside. So get someone else to assess it, first of all. And then that helps you understand, ah, that particular movement is the movement that I struggle with, but the opposite movement is the movement that I need to do more of. That makes so much sense. <laughs> that's right. So that's when you, when you go through that. I would go off to a myotherapist, soft tissue therapist, whatever you're comfortable with. Get someone else to have a really good look at it because they will help you break that yoga practice down to its constituent movements. They have a good look at what we call all the joints in the kinetic chain. So the kinetic chain, I'm talking about my arm. So we're going from the thoracic or the neck area down to the shoulder, down to the elbow, down to the wrist. So someone needs to analyse those for you and give you some feedback on where it's too long. And so we have this language of it's long and weak or it's short and weak. So if it's short and weak, we want to lengthen it. If it's long and weak, we want to strengthen it. And you can get that information, I think, from someone else in a much more useful way. And that makes so much sense because I think mm -hmm. everyone is doing the best for themselves that they know yes. how in their own practice. Yes. And sometimes you just need someone else's eyes and someone else's knowledge and someone else's perspective. Absolutely, yeah. And look, me, I would say the same. I've been looking at anatomy for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. I still ask for someone else to observe me. I can't look in a mirror and get the same information. I think as well, sometimes even just with, like, 
aches and pains and niggles, sometimes you just need someone else's hands. You do. (laughs) You do. Someone else. It feels good. You need that connection. Mm -hmm. You need that information. I agree with you. Get regular massages. Yeah. And luckily I swap it with students who are massage Fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Energetically as well. Yes. It's so important. It is important. It's part of that self-nurturing we talked about initially, isn't it? If you're going to stay up there as a teacher, you've got to make sure you're nurturing yourself. Yeah, we ask a lot of our bodies as yoga teachers. We do. So as much as the physical impact on the body, I'm not sure if you both notice this as teachers, but my experience of just imparting information can be exhausting. And that's the bit I need to look after. So my physical body seems to be all right, but it's trying to find the right words to support every single person in my class, I can come away exhausted from mm. that. And just the energy of supporting everyone in the class. That's it. That's exactly what I'm referring to. <laughs> actually, I just teach um, one class a week at the moment. I work a full-time job. And I actually find, like, usually after I've taught that class, it's the best I feel all week. Okay. So, yeah. It's, sort it's, of a... it's really interesting because it goes both ways. Mm, like, mm. that group energy, like, you can feel amazing afterwards – but if you are just kind of giving out, even mm-hmm. though at the time it feels awesome and like you love it. I mean, a while later, it's just, oh. Well, then you get to the end of the week and you kind of can't make sentences yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah, I get that. After yeah. class number 15. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I understand my situation is pretty, yeah. <laughs> pretty yeah. easy. <laughs> Although, actually, like if I even just spend a whole day on my computer, I'm completely mm. brain fried mm. after that yeah. as well. Yeah. I had a question going back to the myotherapy. Mm. And mm. I guess you touched briefly on how it informed your yoga teaching. But I'm just sort of wondering, it must give you a completely different perspective on, on anatomy than someone who's just from a straight yoga background, perhaps. One, how do you think it's shaped your understanding of anatomy? And two, would you encourage other yoga teachers or people wanting to become a yoga teacher to perhaps look at learning a different modality? Or mm, That's a great question, too. I think I am, was lucky where I had the two skills coming together at the same time. So what I was noticing, if I had a sensation or I had an injury or something was going on in my body, I could work it out. I could go inside and go, oh, yeah, that's that, 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 and that. And that was really, really helpful. So, yes, as a, as a teacher, I think that's really valuable. So if you notice a change in your own body and you think, oh, that's a deep sensation, I'd like to know what's in there. That's when your anatomy is really helpful because you can actually start to go, oh, yeah, that lives under that. that, Oh, that could be that particular area I'm looking at. So that's why I think that really helped me. I had a discussion with Claire about this. We were just talking about energy flow through the body. And there's, I know of three basic models. There's probably more, but there's three basic models that are called Indian anatomies, which I think is lovely. You know, think about it from another perspective. So you might remember this, Joe. You might remember when you had some um, sessions with Lee and perhaps Andrew that we were talking about the values mm-hmm. and then the koshas. Mm-hmm. And then we have what we call the subtle anatomy where we're talking Ida Pingala, Sashumna, da-da-da-da. Now, they are three separate models and really are not meant to be overlapped. They're, they're learned in different ways. So when I was discussing this with Claire, she came back and she said, Kay, I can feel stuff moving. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, I think I need to explore this a bit more. And I said, great, let's go back to those models. So that's where, all right, you might have your physical sensations, but are you moving something move from the centre out? Or are you moving something move down? Or are you feeling something move up? Or is it following a pathway? That's where it is helpful to have a little bit of anatomy. What pathway might it be following? Because the Indian philosophy would be talking about that as an anatomy. So pranic pathways, nadis, whatever we might like to call it, traditional Chinese medicine talk about as meridians. And swing back to connective tissue here, there's quite a lot of research to say connective tissue creates the framework for the energy channels mm. which i love i love that just too. that together beautifully haven't we yeah so instead of saying energy follows along the bloodstream no it doesn't need to the energy is flowing a channel that is contained within your connective tissue so the more yin practice the more space you make an easier flow occurs 
Mm. How interesting is it? Uh, is it called interstitium? Or... Yes, yeah. I've, I think I read about the that. The new yeah. organ that science discovered oh, that yes. actually Chinese medicine has known about for ah, thousands of yes, years. Yes, that would be the, the research my students are getting excited about. Mm. Absolutely. We're all mm. getting excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is exciting because there's more, I'm going to use the word sensations, more subtle sensations mm. to explore. Mm. And it's amazing as well how, I was 12 years ago when I did my teaching, training how much more interlinked these separate systems from different cultures and different times are becoming yeah. as we learn more about how the body works about how like imaging technology improves and we've got more ways to look into the body it's like we're almost getting to see these subtler systems in a more concrete way absolutely or a more physical way much more i agree um when you first start studying i've, I've find this with students I have the pleasure of teaching traditional Chinese medicine practitioners acupuncturists naturopaths and myotherapists all in the one class and we we practice what's called palpatory anatomy so if you touch the skin you've got to try and figure out what's under there well they come at it from three different perspectives yeah. which I love and so they're teaching each other as well it's so good and that's just what you're talking about the more we delve into it the more we see that it meets I guess it makes sense because it all meets within our bodies. It does, <laughs> absolutely. And it's just finding the language to find the meeting point, isn't it? Mm, yeah. yeah. It's time for Pick of the Week. Now, my Pick of the Week is a book that was actually mentioned by David Packman in the episode we recorded with him. And it is a book called Die Wise by Stephen Jenkinson. And he is a man who worked with dying people over many years and he basically says that dying well is a right of everyone and that it is something that it is our responsibility as a culture and a society to pursue. And I, I universally agree with that. And it's a really beautifully written book. He has this calm, meandering style of writing in it. By the way, you look at me, I think you must have read it. because No, I just no, love hearing yeah. you talk about it. It just it's, sounds wonderful. It is wonderful. He, mm. he describes a river that passes through his property or a neighbouring property as the river of abundance in time and a hill that they have in the area which they've dubbed a mountain, even though it's not a mountain. <laughs> um, I'm partway through this book, and there's just so much of it that's resonating with me. So I definitely recommend that everyone read it. So usually Pick of the Week is something that you want people to try or, you know, something to add into their lives. My Pick of the Week is give yourself some space. <laughs> so if you're looking at your week and it's stressing you out before it's even started, have a look at what you could maybe reschedule or what you could cancel. I think we all, as teachers, we love life and I don't want to tell people not to do their practice, but sometimes your practice is staying home and resting rather than, I don't know, beating yourself up and making yourself go to class when it's actually not what you need mm. that day. And I think part of your practice is actually sort of about learning when that Ooh, is. Oh, yeah. 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 self-study. Yes. When do I need space? Yeah. yeah. Totally agree with that comment. Have you got a pick of the week, Kay? Oh, I'm going to reinforce yours, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you inspired me to make it <laughs> as you cancelled an appointment before we started our interview. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is important. I love what you both said. It's that recognition of when it's time. I'm not avoiding no, nope, I'm recognising I'm overwhelmed and really I need to take space and breathe for a while. Really important. Mm, yeah. yeah, I actually had a pretty stressful week this week and I think, yeah, part of what I did this week was just um, my regular classes. I, I thought I'm, I'm just going to take a break and it was actually good to just have that time back. I'm going to go back next week. I'll be right into it. But it was just really good to take a break and I feel much better for it. I think that's called wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> it sometimes happens to me. Yeah. <laughs> Not often. <laughs> wow, thank you so yeah, much, thank Kay. You so much. It's so lovely to see you again. And it's been a real pleasure. All right, and that was our conversation with Kay. I find it really interesting. It feels like functional anatomy is something that's only really been acknowledged as being quite important in yoga recently, but Kay's been practicing and teaching it for, you know, at least 12 to 15 years. So I think perhaps she's just ahead of the curve or perhaps the rest of the world is a little bit behind. Who knows? Controversial. 
On next week's episode, we have an interview with the lovely Lucy Kanani. It's a great episode, and we talk to her about the book that she has co-written with Jill Danks called Connecting Conscious Communication for Yoga Teachers and Therapists. It's a great book. I think anyone who is teaching yoga should get a copy of this book. It's got some great stuff in it. And also, we will be giving away one copy of this book to a lucky listener so stay tuned to that one before i leave you i'd like to ask that you please subscribe rate or review the show on itunes or wherever you download your podcast from we would love to hear from you also you can comment on our website at podcast.flowartist.com or search for the flow artist podcast group on facebook the theme song in this podcast is baby robots by ghost soul and used with permission do yourself a favor and get his music from gosalt.bandcamp.com. See you soon. Big, big love. <laughs>